tonight. They were unfortunate to be abducted by Boko Haram, but they were able to escape. Chadian soldiers found out that they are Cameroonian children. That's Nigerian Major General Abdul Khalif Ibrahim, commander of a multinational task force in the Lake Chad Basin, on five children rescued by Chadian troops. Details coming up. Also, a protest over water shortages in southern Ethiopia turns deadly. Mali has begun a crackdown on hookah smoking. And 12 years after a popular revolt ousted dictator Muammar Gaddafi, Libya is still divided. We have these stories and more on African news tonight. We start with our top story. The British Embassy and others in Nigeria have warned their citizens to avoid banks, ATMs and more than 20 states after a rise in criminality, protests and violence as the election draws near. This comes as the Nigerian Inspector General of Police has deployed over 300,000 security personnel across the country to ensure the safety of citizens. The British Foreign Commonwealth and Development Officer, or FCDO, warned against areas where there are banks and ATMs. The FCDO advised travellers to exercise judgment and be aware of large crowds or potential disturbances. It also warns against travel to more than 20 states, most of them in the north, where militant forces and criminal gangs frequently attack. Nigeria holds its presidential elections on February 25th. At the same time, there is tension in the country caused by a shortage of cash as the government replaces old narrow notes with new redesigned ones. There have been riots near some banks and several people have been injured or killed. The British Embassy said ahead of the general elections, authorities may enforce movement restrictions because of a heightened risk of protests and violence. Nigerian's Inspector General of Police, Osman Al-Khali Baba, says hundreds of thousands of security agency personnel will be deployed over the election period to ensure safety and smooth voting. Baba spoke to journalists at a briefing at the presidential villa in Abuja. The Nigeria police will deploy 310,973 personnel for the election security operations. This will comprise of conventional policemen, the mobile policemen, the special counter-terrorism unit, the special forces, intelligence response team, and other... Baba also said an intelligence unit is in place to track and apprehend those engaged in vote buying or who may want to disrupt the election. President Muhammad Buhari had recently warned the Nigeria police authorities that the eyes of the nation are on them to ensure that the elections go smoothly. Embassies from Ireland, Canada and the United States are among several countries that have warned citizens about hazards in Nigeria ahead of the elections. For VOA News, from Abuja, Nigeria. A multinational force of troops from Benin, Cameroon, Chad, Niger and Nigeria handed five children rescued from Boko Haram over to Cameroon yesterday. The multinational joint task force of the Lake Chad Basin Commission says scores of children were rescued last year in operations against the Muslim militant group. Cameroonian authorities are working to locate the children's parents. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. The Multinational Joint Task Force of the Lake Chad Basin, or MNJTF, that is fighting the jihadist group, says the five children it handed to Cameroonian authorities on Thursday were rescued by Chadian troops. The children were handed over to government officials in Mora, a town in Cameroon's far north region on the border with Chad and Nigeria. The task force said Chadian troops found the five boys in the volatile Lake Chad Basin, looking unkempt, tired, hungry, and sick. The task force commander, Nigerian Major General Abdul Khalifa Ibrahim, said the teenage children spent several months in Boko Haram captivity. He spoke on Cameroon's state broadcaster CRTV. 
They were unfortunate to be abducted by Boko Haram, but they were able to escape. Chadian soldiers found out that they are Cameroonian children. We are going to carry out more operations. Our hope is for the Boko Haram themselves to come out and say this is enough. Cameroon says 25 out of the 60 children transferred to the country by the joint forces in the past three weeks were either saved by the military during operations or escaped from Boko Haram camps and surrendered to troops from Cameroon, Chad and Nigeria fighting the jihadists. The task force says scores of the children were rescued last year in a military operation that killed 800 militants in Lake Chad Basin. The children were kept in Chad for eight months for psychological care and to determine where they were from. The government says the children range in age from 9 to 17 years old. The governor of Cameroon's far north region, Mijiyawa Bakari, says Cameroonian President Paul Bia has ordered that the children be provided with food, medical care and an education while their parents are being found. He spoke to VOA via a messaging app from Marua, capital of Cameroon's far north region. Bakari says Cameroon has well-constructed centers for disarmament, demobilization and reintegration, or DDR, in Meri and Mora, northern towns on the border with Chad and Nigeria. He says the children will be enrolled in a school at the DDR center in Mora. Bakari says Cameroon's medical staff members are at DDR centers ready to attend to the health needs of the children. Bakari said in 2021, Cameroon successfully hosted more than 2,000 former Boko Haram militants, including 950 Nigerians and about 100 Chadians who defected from the jihadist group. In June 2022, the multinational joint task force said 3,000 troops killed 800 jihadists on Lake Chad's islands and neighboring areas between March 28 and June 4 in an operation called Lake Sanity. Officials of the force said they were investigating the countries of origins of several hundred children who were rescued in the operations. The troops say parents of some of the children may have been killed in battles with jihadist groups or have remained in Boko Haram camps as militants or captives. The Lake Chad Basin stretches across the borders of Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. The multinational force with troops from Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad says although attacks have been drastically reduced, Boko Haram and another group, the Islamic State West Africa province, have established bases in the vast Lake Chad Basin. According to the UN, 36,000 people have been killed and 3 million have fled their homes in Cameroon, Nigeria and Chad since 2009 when the fighting deteriorated into an armed conflict with Nigerian government troops. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. A protest over water shortages in the southern Ethiopian town of Olkite turned deadly when witnesses say security forces opened fire on protesters, killing at least two people. Maya Masakura reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The protest was started early Thursday morning by a group of elderly women holding jerry cans for carrying water and, according to one witness, gradually swelled to thousands of people. Adana Kafle, a Olkite resident who was at the protest, told VOA Friday that security forces started telling people to sit down after talking with some protesters. He says, when we sat down, we couldn't really make out what was being said, and they were not sharing any information with us. It is in this situation, as I was in the front, that they tear-gassed us. We tried to save ourselves, and people started throwing rocks. After then, they started shooting. After that, people dispersed in different directions. Dr. Bahailu Daggo, a surgeon at Walkite University Referral Hospital, said that two protesters were shot and died on arrival at the hospital. He says all of the injuries were from bullet wounds. The sad part is that we don't have any blood banks in the area. There were another four or five people who have had bullet wounds in their arms and legs. 
In a report Friday, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission put the death toll at three and said at least 30 people had sustained injuries due to bullet wounds. Officials in the area say the violence was sparked by protesters throwing rocks at the local water bureau building and blocking roads, according to the report. Walkite, a town of about 70,000 and the capital of the Gurage zone, has been plagued by water shortages for months amid the ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa. A resident said there was a water drilling project that local authorities promised would solve the problem, but nothing came of it. Calls to the mayor of Walkite, as well as the zonal peace and security chief, went unanswered. Maya Masikir for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. You're listening to Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yehiyus Wuhib in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. Libya's popular uprising began on February 17, 2011. It overthrew Muammar Gaddafi's 42 years of dictatorship and raised hopes for a better life for the populace. But today the North African country is still divided and its politics and security remain deadlocked. VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shanawi discussed the reasons behind that with Hani Ishanib, president and founder of National Council on U.S. Libya Relations. When the revolution of uh, 2011 occurred in Libya, it was a spontaneous anger of the streets within a population that was not prepared for such a revolution. Preceding this, this was a population that was undereducated, lacked any political experience, had no political parties, and the fact that they actually just went out in the streets and toppled Gaddafi with the assistance of NATO did not qualify them to be able to build a state, and that is why this This crisis in Libya is continuing. There is no infrastructure politically to be able to form institutions and build a state the way it should be. Libyan people showed a great deal of courage in their uprising against Gaddafi's one-man rule. So why did Libyan political figures fail to unite the country and reach a political solution? I think that who we call elite are not necessarily classified in the appropriate way. What has surfaced on the leadership of Libya was not the meritocracy that is required to build a state. It was primarily city and tribal leaders who lacked the experience to build a state. And again, the country evolved into a situation where what we call elite lack the leadership skills to build the state. Looking to the near future, what would it take to achieve the long-awaited goal of a stable, unified, peaceful Libya? It is very difficult to imagine that Libya can get out of its quagmire that exists right now in the current culture of tribalism and city based competition, whether you're from Zintan or Misrata or from Darna or Benghazi or else, the cities of Libya need to evolve from the culture of nepotism and appointing individuals that belong to their tribe or to the city as opposed to appointing or recommending or supporting the true experts that can actually build the country. The meritocracy that is capable of creating the institutions that need to evolve Libya from it is medieval very backward institutions that were destroyed during the era of Gaddafi. So what do you expect the U.S. to do to help the Libyan people? I think the United States need to do two things. Number one is exert its power to actually deter foreign influence in Libya. The meddling of foreigners in Libya is negatively impacting the ability to have proper Libyan evolution of their institutions. And the restraints that are made by the primarily military influence of foreigners is making it difficult for the Libyans to make their own choices. Number two, the United States can also start injecting into Libya the true support that is required, and this is not just the United States, but also the Europeans and so on. They need to inject into Libya a hybrid of expertise that will assist in building the institutions. We have seen how frail countries have actually benefited from inviting experts from the outside. Libya in every walk, in every department, in every institution lacks the experts that are capable of of making 
recommendations, advice as to the strategies of the institutions to be able to get rid of so many problematic issues such as corruption, poor human capacity in every aspect of it. If you walk into any administration, any ministry today, you will discover very quickly that the middle management is the weakest link in Libya today. If the United States and those who internationals who want to support Libya can contribute to the expertise that are required, I think this is going to make a big difference. And that was Hani Shanib, president and founder of National Council on U.S.-Libya Relations, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi. A political scientist uh, who, te- who teaches at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service says women of color have an important role to play in foreign affairs. Professor Nola Haynes describes to VOA's Carol Van Dam why she recently hosted a chat about women of color advancing peace in foreign affairs as part of Georgetown's U.S. Black History Month events. I know that it's kind of one of those throwaway lines we talk about. America was founded and built, you know, on the backs of immigrants and slaves. And that's a that's just really a true statement. And our country is diverse. It's been diverse. And the world is also diverse, which is why it makes sense for the United States to have a very strong, diverse uh, foreign policy presence um, throughout starting with, you know, our diplomats, foreign service officers, military, politicians, academics, across the entire spectrum. It needs to reflect what the country looks like. And it must be important, too, for the officials and the dignitaries that you meet with in those countries. Absolutely, because, you know, it also speaks to the American promise about our values. You know, if diversity is our strongest asset, we need to keep that promise and we need to show that. And, you know, a lot of our allies and a lot of our adversaries are watching and they're watching to see if we're keeping our word. Both our allies and our adversaries are paying attention to the things that we say and if we're keeping our word. And that's an that's an important promise to keep. And if the people sitting at the table uh, negotiating an agreement or whatever does not look like you, then you're wondering, hmm, is diversity really America's you know strongest asset or is that just something to say? You were named one of the top 50 leaders in national security and foreign affairs by the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Diversity in National Security. Talk about what you have seen over the past few years. Is is it changing in the direction that you would like to see it change, at least with the U.S. State Department and Foreign Service? I am kind of a newbie to this space. But what I will say is what I've seen so far, especially, you know, my colleagues, they're very diverse and it's it's a good feeling. It's really a good feeling to sit around the table, a table that reflects what the country actually looks like to have women, to have men of, you know, spanning the, the, the spectrum of ethnicities and races, thinking about very important security problems. That brings me joy because, you know, pretty soon I'm going to write an op ed about um being the on, the only one, being hyper visible and invisible at the same time. And the feeling of being the only one in the room, yes, in some regards, that is that that's progress, I guess. <laughs> but also, you know, it's it's sometimes it's not the best feeling in a world because you feel like you have to always represent for everyone else who isn't in the room. That's Nola Haynes, a professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, who was named by the Center for Strategic and International Studies as one of the top 50 leaders in national security and foreign affairs. She was speaking with my colleague, Carol Van Dam in Washington. <music> Authorities in Mali have began a crackdown on hookah smoking after the end of a six-month grace period to adjust to the ban. According to the French news agency AFP, the country's anti-drug agency says it has carried out dozens of arrests in the capital Bamako and seized water pipes. The Central Narcotics Office says on Tuesday night about 50 individuals were apprehended and their material seized. Authorities say those caught smoking would be liable for up to 10 days in prison and a fine of up to 15 U.S. dollars. Hookahs, or shisha, 
burn fruit-flavored tobacco, which is inhaled through a long rubber tube passing through water to cool. The World Health Organization says the practice is ten times more harmful than smoking cigarettes. The Egyptian government says it is working around the clock to gain the release of six Coptic Christians kidnapped in western Libya. The foreign ministry says they were kidnapped by criminal gangs about a week ago and are detained in an illegal immigration center there. The French news agency AFP says they were looking for work in construction and abducted as they traveled between Benghazi and Tripoli. The kidnappers are demanding $30,000 for each of the six men. The wire service says thousands of Egyptians work in Libya's construction service, agriculture, and handicraft sectors. Thousands fled after a 2015 broadcast by the Islamic State showing the beheading of 21 Egyptian Copts in western Libya but may still continue to work in the country. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia 